since you all have been looking at my book, uh, I wanted to say something about the organization of the materials there. I think that's how I lead into it and talk about that uh, summary of what it contains and why it contains what it contains. And then we can open it up to questions and answers uh, and have a free discussion. Uh, so here you can see Sri Aurobindo. Uh, you can see he, he, that's how he looked in 1950. Uh, that's a headshot taken by the famous photographer Ari Cartier Bresson, who was in India at that time and uh, took photographs of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. You, you also have a famous photograph of Gandhi at the same time. So in any case, um, that's his last year. That's the last year, <clears throat> the year he passed uh, in, uh, you know, at the end in December, very close to where our time period right now. In fact, today is a special day in the calendar of Sri Aurobindo. He had a special realization uh, on the 24th of November. But what's on the right is uh, his symbol. So he had a, a, a tantric symbol uh, and you can see that symbol. Um, and that symbol is a very common symbol and it's actually a universal symbol, a world symbol uh, made up of two interlocking triangles. If you didn't know it was a tantric symbol, you'd say it's the star of David. Lots of people use that term. But in esoteric uh, Judaism, it's actually better known as the seal of Solomon. And that's how it was known. And actually, uh, the reason I wanted to begin with this slide um, and show you his symbol is that uh, this symbol is really a hybrid symbol. It's a universal symbol, a symbol of comparative mysticism across the world. And uh, that's its origin, even in the life of Sri Aurobindo. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how it came to become his symbol. Um, so here we see the origins of that symbol. Uh, on the left, you see uh, the, uh, the cover page of a magazine that used to be brought out in Paris in 1901 called the Revue Cosmique. And uh, you can see that uh, symbol right there. The, the symbol consists of two triangles and the square that's formed in, in between them uh, has uh, water, waves. And on the waves, there is a lotus. It's exactly uh, what we saw, just a little bit more simplified and refined. But uh, to the right of that is uh, the cover page of a magazine. Okay, so going back, that magazine review Cosmique was founded by a rather remarkable character in Paris uh, who went by the name of Max Theon. And uh, he was an esotericist who had his background in, you know, in, in the Kabbalah and free form Western e esotericism. Um, and one of his students was Mira Alfasa, later to become the mother of the Sri Aurobindo Ashram. Uh, the story linking the mother to Sri Aurobindo includes this symbol because uh, her then husband, whose name was Paul Richard, was going to India and uh, she had a inner uh, guidance, premonition, dream, not sure, some kind of indication that a teacher was waiting for her in India and the right person would be a yogi who would interpret the symbol for her. And uh, Max Theon, I'm sorry, Paul Richard uh, went to Pondicherry. That's because it was French India. That's where he first went. And uh, 
from day one, he was on the lookout for this yogi who would interpret the symbol. So he asked the people he met. And these people were in the circle of Sri Aurobindo and they took him to Sri Aurobindo very soon, very quickly. I think the first or second day. And uh, <clears throat> Sri Aurobindo gave him an interpretation of this symbol. And he took it back and the mother was immediately satisfied. And that's when they went in 1914 uh, to uh, Pondicherry together to meet Sri Aurobindo. But what you see on the right, so I mean, you can see that the genesis of that symbol is actually already a quasi-theosophist, you know, the, 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 these people. In fact, he claimed, Max Theon claimed that he and Madame Blavatsky had studied together at a certain point in their lives with, with an esoteric teacher. Uh, but on the right, you see what was happening in India in 1909, when Sri Aurobindo was still in Calcutta, just before he went to Pondicherry, he was producing a, a journal or a magazine. And uh, on the cover of that magazine is a very similar symbol. What you see there uh, is the two triangles, uh, you know, which are slightly <clears throat> more curvilinear like petals, but the in inner, inner petals, you can see those two triangles. And what is emerging around it is a lotus, as if the lotus is blossoming inside or from inside the intersecting triangles and radiating outwards. So uh, he was already using a similar symbol and uh, when they met, uh, he decided to adopt that symbol as his tantric symbol. <clears throat> so what is that symbol? Um, those who are knowledgeable about Tantra know that symbol very well. Uh, it is the very foundation of what is called the Yantra or, or the Yantra, the term Yantra literally means instrument or engine. And really it's an engine of becoming. In other words, it is a static image for dynamic forces that are interacting in a certain pattern. And that pattern is supposed to open out your own consciousness and make it flow in a certain configuration so that you have a certain kind of, uh, you know, a certain kind of uh, assemblage of forces <clears throat> leading to a certain experience of being. So that symbol in Tantra is, in traditional Tantra, uh, is uh, considered to be the union of Purusha and Prakriti. Uh, and again, we come across two terms that you all may have uh, encountered, uh, particularly since Chris is one of the world experts on Sankhya. Uh, he, he must have introduced these terms. Um, the, but Sankhya, which uses Purusha and Prakriti, the terms Purusha and Prakriti are the two fundamental uh, you know, elements of, of Sankhya. And Purusha, uh, I would, I mean, they, they are gender. Purusha is gendered male and Prakriti is gendered female. But Purusha uh, stands for consciousness. And Prakriti uh, can be loosely translated as nature. And uh, the whole enterprise of Sankhya begins by asking the question, what is conscious in us? So if you are to ask yourself the question, what is in what in me is conscious? You, we, we think of ourselves as entirely conscious, but actually a, a lot of what we take ourselves to be are automatisms. They're just predictable responses of nature. They're uh, material nature, which is run by the laws of physics and chemistry. 
there's psychological nature, which psychology tries to understand as laws, mental nature, which runs by logic. So there are various kinds of laws that are operating inside us, which we take to be conscious. So Sankhya tries to separate the entire uh, mechanical operation of automatisms from something which is essentially conscious inside, inside us. And that which is essentially conscious, they call Purusha, that which is made up of a variety of automatisms, they call Prakriti. So we can go back and say that this triangle, this set of tri interlocking triangles is the union of Purusha and Prakriti. And that is how Tantra sees it. And I'll come to that in a moment. But how did Sri Aurobindo and the mother see it? So let's start with that because the mother gave an explanation for this symbol that they were using in this magazine when she met him. And this is uh, what she says. She says, the descending triangle represents Sat Chit Ananda. The ascending triangle represents the aspiring answer from matter under the form of light, lo life, light, and love. The juncture of both, the central square, is the perfect manifestation, having at its center the avatar of the supreme, the lotus. The a water inside the square represents the multiplicity, the creation. So this is, you may say, a modern and more universalized explanation, which includes Indian and Vedantic terminology. Satchit Ananda is what we may call spirit um, or Brahman in uh, the Vedantic uh, terms. Uh, so that is how they see it. But let's look at the comparison between that and other traditional ways of seeing it. And uh, I draw your attention to what's below that symbol first. As I said, Sankhya sees it as the union of Purusha and Prakriti or consciousness and nature. But Sankhya is a kind of layer, a archeological foundation that becomes absorbed or assimilated into a variety of other Indian uh, schools of thought. So the Gita will absorb it as well. And the Gita will create its own kind of scheme with Sankhya, the Gita Sankhya. And the Gita Sankhya is slightly nuanced and modified because Sankhya is a dualistic system. In other words, the whole aim of Sankhya is to separate consciousness from nature, or from the automatisms of nature, so that consciousness can become free of nature. Now, of course, this is an interpretation. And as Chris knows well, there are very good scholars, friends of ours who have challenged that interpretation. But it is the traditional interpretation that we uh, separate uh, the conscious part in us, which becomes a pure witness and allow the rest of the automatisms to operate automatically till they fall off. And you are just a spiritual uh, consciousness. The Gita looks at this in an, as I said, a more nuanced way. The Gita, because it's part of a Vedantic system, uh, it actually believes in a, another kind of dualism. That dualism is the dualism of what's called vidya and avidya, or knowledge and ignorance. So there is a, or we could call it heaven and earth. Uh, so there is a spiritual realm in which unity prevails. There is one consciousness. And in that, this duality is implicit but it is united. So Purusha and Prakriti there are not separated into consciousness and the automatisms of nature, but are 
the 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 nature of spirit itself spirit and nature together and the gita uses the term purushottama for krishna which means the supreme person and the nature of the supreme person is the supreme prakriti or para prakriti so that is the higher potency or potential of union of uh, purusha and prakriti but in our lives in the ignorance it operates as a duality purusha and prakriti tantra also absorbs that same foundation and actually looks at it with slightly different terminology but it's actually very similar to what the gita is saying according to tantra we live a life in which consciousness and nature are not in coordination with one another but they are trying to aim at a dialogic reality which ultimately becomes a unity and a harmony and that is seen in terms of ishvara and shakti so on the higher the the more vidya uh, range of things the heavenly range of things you have ishvara and shakti or the person the divine person god and the energy of god that are gendered male and female and so you see that in tantra and particularly it's exemplified in in uh, buddhist tantra uh where you'll find the yab yum image the image of the male and female in union uh in embrace and that is really the ishvara shakti relationship of the purusha and prakriti if they separate and don't know how to meet that's the natural condition of purusha and prakriti so we find already over here there are two dualities one duality is the duality of consciousness and nature and the other duality are two kinds of workings of consciousness and nature either they work out of sync with one another or they work in complete union with one another right so these dualities are combined in that symbol see that symbol is really the symbol of the ishvara shakti or the purush purushottama para prakriti the symbol of the union of god and nature you may say um translating it into our terminology into our modern terminology of world religions and world mysticism uh, as i pointed out from the very beginning this symbol is a hybrid symbol it belongs to our times and it's already a a kind of a, a world symbol so we can look at it in terms of teachers like mercia eliade uh who has spoken of an axis mundi right a a world axis connecting heaven and earth or spirit and matter so these are the two polarities and uh, they are connected by a axis uh and these this uh, as people like eliade have pointed out relate to our own will you know so we can talk about world spirituality as inflected along two contradictory wills both these wills exist in us one is a will to transcendence and the other is a will to enjoyment and you see to, scholars have talked about this these two wills um in terms of uh two images of the world and these images of the world are both images we carry with ourselves and if we look at the traditions of indian spirituality we'll see that they are also divided along these two kinds of wills the first view of the world which is one of the earliest uh, philosophical views that emerges in india is that the world is a prison we live in a a state of imprisonment we are imprisoned by laws 
And we can see that that is exactly what Sankhya itself is trying, that it's trying to separate that which is free from the world of laws and the bondages of a world of laws. And so this idea of being bound by the laws of matter, the laws of mind, the laws of psychology, the laws of our uh, social world, the laws of our political world, um, being oppressed and being bound, yields the will to transcendence. You see, we want to be liberated from everything. We want to be completely free. And that is the entire, uh, you know, enterprise of uh, the liberational uh, spiritualities of India. And uh, just to kind of uh, encapsulate them, I've used the term Vedanta there. Vedanta, um, of course, is a much more nuanced and uh, big umbrella, but um, in a kind of a stereotypical sense, uh, it is developed around the idea of the will to transcendence. On the other hand, you have the other pole of world spirituality, which can be called magic. And magic is really a knowledge of the world of laws. What are the laws of matter? What are the laws of mind? Ultimately, what are the laws of animism that go behind matter and mind? And how can we manipulate them to develop power in the world? How can we enjoy the world? This is the entire domain of a set of philosophies that can be encapsulated and stereotyped as Tantra in India. So we can see that this diagram, in a sense, is about these two polarities, the polarity of the will to transcendence and the polarity of the will to enjoyment um, of the earth and, and in the earth. So above, you can see how Vedanta and Tantra resolve themselves into goals. The goals of Vedanta are liberation, which in Sanskrit is called mukti, and knowledge, which in Sanskrit is called jnana. Knowledge here is not the book knowledge that we call knowledge. But knowledge is knowledge by being, knowledge by experience. And the whole idea is that if we really know, then we are free. I mean, that, that is even the premise of the enlightenment, that we become rationally free. That is enlightenment. And that brings us knowledge. The condition for knowledge, which is also the condition for the knowledge academy, in which we are studying is that we are mentally free to be able to know the world as an object. You know, we are not infected by the object. We are subjectively free. Of course, that is easier said than done, but these schools are actually trying for that kind of freedom and that kind of knowledge, not objectively separating the subject, but becoming the object due to experience of oneness. So that, that these become the goals of liberation and unity and knowledge that arises from that. Tantra's goals, which we may call the goals of magic, <clears throat> and we have to think of these now as stereotypical terms that resolve to world spiritualities. You can find this all over the world. You can find these kinds of systems. Uh, our power, which in Tantra is called Shakti, and Siddhi is really the attainment of powers, different kinds of capacities. Enjoyment, which is called Bhukti. And immortality, which is called Kaya Siddhi, or the power, the ultimate power of the body. 
to persist. So these are really the goals of magic, you know, and, and we can see that these goals run through all the traditions of magic uh, across across the world. So these two major sort of viewpoints are uh, wills, existential wills, are what compose the union of the two triangles that ultimately give us this particular uh, engine or yantra. So I bring this up because uh, you've been looking at my book, and this is what's on the cover of the book. It's a scheme of organization of Sri Aurobindo's yoga, which is known as integral yoga. And uh, this is the integral of the integral yoga. The integral of the integral yoga is the integration of these two wills that we just spoke about. But when I wrote this book, I didn't have that clearly in my mind. It was a dim intuition. But since that time, I have developed greater clarity. And that's why when you look at this, you see some names. You see the names of the seven quartets. And the names uh, are uh, aligned in a certain manner. You can see that the upward uh, apex has knowledge the downward apex has body, and then the two sidereal ones have being and action and peace and power. But if you look at the record of yoga on which this is based, which is Sri Aurobindo's diaries, <clears throat> he organizes these seven according to a slightly different scheme. And it's organized according to a three and a four. <clears throat> So the three are what he calls the general siddhis. The general siddhis by general siddhis are meant the overarching goals of this system. The overarching goals of this system are the three. So you can find, if we look uh, at... Uh, one of the sidereal, uh, you know, lines, being, yoga, and action. So being is, uh, I've used the term being uh, as a translation for what he calls Brahma Chatushta, or the quartet of Brahman. And action I've used as the quartet of karma. So Brahman is, uh, you know, one of the three. Karma is one. And yoga is the third. And you can see right in the center, you have yoga. So these three, Brahman, yoga, and karma, form a vertical axis. That's why they are the general siddhis. And the other four are specific siddhis. They are specialized siddhis. So those are knowledge, peace, body, and power. So now, if we slightly tilt the, these terms, if we go clockwise and move the second being to the top and action to the bottom, we find a better fit to what Sri Aurobindo is actually doing in the uh, in, in his diaries and in, in his actual practice. And how does that come about? What is the rationale for that? The rationale for that is essentially, as I said, the central goal of Vedanta is Brahman, is the attainment of spiritual being. And the central goal of Tantra is spiritual action, how to act in the world. But he is getting that notion of action, though it is one, one might call it a, a tantric uh, you know, uh, approach, he's getting it from the Gita. And after I actually put it together like an intuitive flash, a very, very famous verse from the Gita occurred to me as I feel quite possibly the motivation behind the very center of this entire scheme. 
Chris will know what I'm talking about. And some of you may know what I'm talking about as well. If you're familiar with the Gita or even just with Indian customs and have gone to meals with some Indian family that is a little devout, and you will find that they will use the Hindu version of the grace in India. And uh, what it is, is I'm going to recite it for you. It's <clears throat> Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavir, Brahmagnau, Brahmanahutam, Brahmaiva Tena Gantavyam, Brahma Karma Samadhina. So the entire verse is about the sacrifice, which is ultimately the, the or original, the, the sacrifice is the Vedic sacrifice, which is a fire sacrifice. So it takes the fire sacrifice and it inflects it in terms of Brahman, which is the spiritual principle, the, the, one, the one being there is. So what it says is Brahm, uh, <clears throat> Brahma, uh, Brahmagna, uh, Brahman is the fire, Brahman Ahutam, Ahuti is the, is the offering. Uh, uh, what is the first one? Uh, not Brahmagna. Uh, Brahmarpanam, Arpan, Arpan is the offering. Uh, Brahmarpanam, Brahma Havir, Havir is the priest of the offering. Uh, Brahma, Brahm, um, Brahmarpanam, Brahma Havir, Brahmagna, Brahman is the fire, Brahman, Brahman Ahutam. So Brahman is the the will or the or the or the motive, the the the, the aspiration that is in the entire sacrifice. Brahmevatena, Brahman is the goal, right? Gantafyam, that where it goes, where does it go? The telos. Uh, Brahma karma samadhina. Now this is the term, right? This is the last line of that entire phrase. Brahma karma samadhina means action in union with Brahman. The word samadhi is being used there in a specialized sense, not as the sense in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, but in a sense as in the Gita, which means union of Brahman and karma. And that's exactly what we see. Brahma and karma at two ends, yoga in the center. The entire scheme is about Brahma, karma, samadhi. Now, then we go to the specialized uh, systems. And here we see a better representation of the whole. On top, you see the axis and the, uh, the, the, you know, the two axes, the, uh, you may call them the hemispheres of Vedanta and Tantra uh, inflected around the Purusha and the Prakriti. Uh, Brahma is on top. Uh, karma or action is at the bottom. Yoga is in the center. Brahma Karma Samadhi, the union of Brahma and Karma composes the axis mundi, the central uh, axis. Brahma or the Vedantic pole has two wings to it. Those are the wings of peace and knowledge of samatha or, or, or peace and vijnana or knowledge. Karma or action has two wings to it, which are the tantric wings of power and the body, shakti and sharira, power and the body. So we see how the two uh, Vedantic and tantric uh, goals are converging in this diagram as the book points out in terms of the seven goals or the seven approaches of this yoga. 
Now we can go one step further and see how these seven are related to different traditional systems in India. I've already talked about Tantra and Vedanta and the central uh, uh, yoga of the Vedanta is the yoga of Brahman. So, and that Brahman is a term that is introduced by, by the Upanishads that are the basis of what is called Vedanta. Vedanta is the end of the Veda and is a synonym for the Upanishads, though later the interpretations of the Upanishads have been called Vedanta. And you find that Vedanta encompasses as its goals, peace, union, and knowledge. But also you could say that the the, the peace part of it is the goal of Shaivism. So you can see that Shaiva schools are represented in that Shanti or Samatha uh, practice. Um, karma or action is the central goal of kar the Karma Yoga of the Gita. So the Gita is represented centrally in that pole. And Shakti and Sari, Sharira are the central goals of Tantra. So we can see how Shaivism, Tantra, the Gita, and the Upanishads are all included and integrated here. At the very center of it all is Vaishnavism, because this scheme is a Tantric Vaishnavism. That is what it really, Sri Aurobindo's uh, esoteric practice was devotion to Krishna and Kali. And that is really the tantric Vaishnavism that forms the heart of this entire system. Uh, now, as I said right in the beginning, there are two kinds of dualities. One is the duality of Purusha and Prakriti, which means the duality of consciousness and nature which are separated in our ordinary life. And the other is the union of the two. And so what we find in this particular case is that these dualities, as we experience them, that have become the two wills, the will to liberation and the will to enjoyment, both have to be developed. One can be, you see, those who are familiar with modern theory are also familiar perhaps with feminism and with the idea of two views of the world. One is an androcentric view, the view of the male, which is really a polarized binary view, which has the male as the center. And the other is the gynocentric view. The gynocentric view is participatory. It is that which is earth-centered, relational. And so you have the two of them and you could actually look at them separately as two separate systems, but you could also look at them together. You could look at them in relation. And if you look at them in relation, then you find that you have two kinds of practices and these two kinds of practices don't need to be separated from each other they can coexist. And that's what this system is about. It amplifies both the Vedantic and the Tantric practices separately in our lives. You have to do them both so that they come to a point where they become one, where they converge from Purusha and Prakriti systems to Ishvara and Shakti systems, you see? When you amplify each to its maximum, they find their union. This is the principle behind this particular yantra. So if we are to look at goals, and I'll stop here in a moment, we find that each one of these, one second, Uh, each one of these, uh, for example, Brahma, if we, if we are to take the central one, the central one is a good example for the whole because that encapsulates the entire system. It's a fractal system, a system in which what is at the center 
is included in all the peripheral elements. So we find that we have the two poles of Vedanta and Tantra, and here is the Siddhi, uh, the central Siddhi, Yoga Siddhi, and then around it are the lesser Siddhis, Brahma, Samatha, or Vijnana, and Karma, Shakti, and Sharira. So these are the three Vedantic, uh, so are constellating around Vedanta, Brahma, or being, peace, and knowledge, and constellating around, around Tantra, action, power, and the body. So each one of them has four goals. And of these, two goals will be Vedantic and two goals will be Tantric, which is a way of saying that just like the, you know, yin-yang yin diagram, you know, in which you find that the yin is involved in the yang and the yang is involved in the yin, we find that Vedanta is involved in Tantra and Tantra is involved in Vedanta. So each one of these, and we can see, uh, we, can, we don't have time to go through the whole, but we can just see the center, the yoga, uh, yoga quartet has four goals. Shuddhi, which means lib, uh, purification, Mukti, which means liberation, Siddhi, which means you know, the powers, the abilities, and bhukti, which means enjoyment. So these four are the central goals of this entire system. Two of the goals are Vedantic, purification and liberation, and two of them are tantric, ability to act in the world and enjoyment. So just like that, each one of these has got, even the Vedantic ones have got tantric goals and the tantric ones have Vedantic goals. Uh, uh, without going further uh, into detail, I'll stop here so that we can discuss or comment on what has uh, transpired so far. Professor yes, Chris. Chris, you had something. Yeah, I just wanted to ask quickly why you would characterize it as Vaishnava uh, because of the presence of Kali. And I think of Kali more as Shaiva. And second, I'm just thinking of the symmetry across the centuries of Calcutta with both Chaitanya, who is the epitome of the Vaishnava, but also Ramakrishna, who is in some ways both universalist, but also very Tantra Shaiva. Yeah, quite right, uh, Chris. Uh, you know, so Sri Aurobindo is really in the Bengali tradition. So the Bengali Vaishnavism at the time at which he's practicing it, or maybe he's giving it his own turn, uh, but Bengali Tantrism and Bengali Vaishnavism include a kind of streak of uh, Krishna Kali, uh, you know, sort of uh, union. In other words, Kali is seen as the Shakti of Krishna. Um, this is also true in part of the Dasa Mahavidya tradition, which is a Tantric tradition. Uh, Kali in the Dasa Mahavidya system has Krishna as her, uh, her, her, uh, Purusha, Ishwara. Ishwara. Uh, he's not particularly coming out of that, but the reason I call it uh, Vaishnav is that if you look at the record of yoga, at the center of the record of yoga is a Pancharatra Vaishnavism, mm -hmm. a kind of inflection of Pancharatra that he himself gives, but it's basically Pancharatra. So that at the very peak of everything is Narayana. Mm -hmm. And then you have a division of Narayana into Vasudeva and then the Vrishni heroes, which is Krishna, Balarama, Aniruddha and Pradyumna, mm -hmm. you know, the Vrishni heroes. And then these heroes have got Shaktis and the Shaktis for him are uh, Maheshwari, Mahakali, Mahalakshmi, and Mahasaraswati. But these, these four, this fourfold system at its peak is an emanation 
from the union of Krishna and Kali. Mm. So it is a Pancharatra, but a Bengali Pancharatra, which is probably his own invention, but he's deriving it from the, you know, from the soil of Bengal, basically. And you talked about, uh, you know, Chaitanya and Ramakrishna. I feel, and I'm presently in conversation with people like Ayon Maharaj that you, you know, right. um, you know, that I, I am more and more convinced that Ramakrishna was a very, very strong influence in his life at this time. And mm -hmm. that a lot of this is, is actually his inflection of things that he picked up from Ramakrishna, uh, Tantra, uh, a Vaishnav Tantra that he created out of uh, things he got from Ramakrishna. Wonderful. Okay, Sylvia has a question. Thank you, um, Professor Devashish, firstly, for writing this. It makes it much more easy to access the primary source of Sri Bindu. I looked at it and it was very intimidating. Um, I wanted to comment on two things. The, the first being the, the duality between the, the, the Shakti and, um, sorry, the more masculine element. Um, it's quite interesting in, in Chinese philosophy, there's a concept of Wu, which is seen as feminine and is seen as meontological in the sense of being a non-being. Whether Shakti is the same, I don't exactly know if you consider it a non-being or a being, but even the Wu is considered to exist. So it's controversial, but I think that there's quite um, significant um, dialogue that could occur between Tao Te Ching chapter 10 that characterizes the Wu as Interestingly, in context of the feminist thinking that you just mentioned, actually char characterizes the feminine space as a center, which might be unique um, to Chinese tradition. It might be interesting to compare. The second thing I wanted to mention, and this I think might be more useful or interesting to you, um, perhaps you don't remember, it was just a brief portion of the book, but you mentioned Kant and you characterize Kant as having more of the um, transcendental, uh, or I would say the, the viewing of trying to it was either they characterized it in the, in the sense of the laws, either he was interpreting the world as such, or he was engaging in the modality of thought that's trying to transcend them. Either way, there is something interesting going on in Kant scholarship now. And I actually wrote something about this for the, present, for, uh, the book. And that is that there's aspects of Kant that actually seem to go more towards the feminine and the meontological in the sense of the non-being. So there's a portion called the canon where Kant talks about happiness, interestingly, because you characterize the feminine in sense of Tantra. I think you could also consider it happiness. Um, Kant says, is essentially arguing that the uh, basis for happiness cannot be known along the lines of the types of certainty that you'd have for mathematics. So you can't necessarily, you can't necessarily have that type of knowing of happiness of course, the reading that you that you that you have of of it being a rule based system, he does have for morality. If you're interested, I can email you the relevant section. Um, I actually I'm considering possibly writing something in response to your book, given those two things. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, that's quite a quite a full plate there. Uh, number of things. Um, I, I, you know, to respond to what you said, of course, you have two major chunks. One is uh, the Chinese uh, comparison uh, with the Wu. And uh, at first you use the notion of the non-being. Uh, the non-being uh, or, or uh, the notion of chaos, for example, uh, would be what is beyond or, uh, you know, the, the, the unknowable. So, you know, as you know, uh, Vedanta inflects its uh, epistemology in terms of the known, the unknown and the unknowable. So the unknowable, uh, which is really uh, the radical infinity of being or, or of, of, that, of the indescribable that cannot be called being, but is being as non-being is uh, something that is necessary to uh, you know a, 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 you know a, 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 an ontology of radical infinity. 
so that is there, but that once that begins, and you can call that a, a feminine space, you can certainly call that a feminine space from the feminist point of view because it is not determined. Determination is uh, something that is related to the masculine space, that it is ultimately determined. But of course, if we look at this system as transcendental and imminent at the same time, you know, panentheistic, transcendental and imminent at the same time, then uh, we have to go beyond the gender space of that kind, you know. The, the masculine is also not determined in that sense. It determines, but it is not determined. So, uh, and the feminine space remains undetermined and cannot be determined from that point of view. So, yeah, I, I would agree with you there about the characterization of the woo. And interestingly, as uh, Chris was saying, he brought up the notion of, of, of uh, he brought up the name of Ramakrishna. Uh, what you said about the woo reminded me of that, uh, of Ramakrishna. Uh, Ramakrishna was, uh, I mean, I think centrally a tantric. And, uh, you know, he, there's actually, I shouldn't even say I think, I think there's no doubt that he was a tantric. He was um, through and through a, in relation with Kali. And uh, he had a Vedantic teacher, uh, Advaitic teacher by the name of Totapuri, who insisted that he ought to have a experience of Nirvikalpa Samadhi um, the samadhi outside of the cosmos, a kind of non-being, as you just pointed out, the, 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 the samadhi of non-being. And uh, he would repeatedly see the image of Kali when he went into his meditation. And uh, Totapuri finally got uh, very angry with him and stuck a, a glass splinter between his eyes and said, you're not coming out until you have that experience. And so he, the next time he saw the image of Kali, uh, he said to her, uh, I need to get out of my obsession with you. How do I do that? And in his uh, meditation, she gave him her sword and said, cut off my neck. And he does that in his meditation and he experienced the Nirvikalpa Samadhi. Now, the interesting thing is if you look at the Kathamrita, if, if you look at his uh, utterances about this experience, uh, he says, I had the experience of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. And in that experience, I realized there is no place where she is not. In other that words, that, that is the original home of, of the Shakti. It's quite interesting because in Dada Jing, I think it might be 72, but it characterizes the Wu as going, um, or uh, the feminine softness as being something that can permeate everything. So it's, it's quite yeah. interesting to see these links between the, the Chinese classical philosophy and the, and the, the um, yogic philosophy here. Um, yeah. Simply because you wouldn't necessarily think there would be a link, but I think that there are pretty strong resources for that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just in passing about your uh, comment regarding Kant, uh, you know, I, I, I don't remember <clears throat> having constellated Kant with, uh, uh, you know, with, 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 uh, with masculinity necessarily, but yes, Transcendental, of course, his philosophy is called, uh, you know, transcendental, uh, you know, what? Transcendental, uh, critical transcendentalism. And there is a transcendental element to it, which is he is trying to create a metaphysics of imminence. But he admits that that metaphysics of immanence is constrained by the transcendental zone and categories 
of time, space, and causation. In other words, time, space, and causation come to us from beyond. We don't control it. We see, we experienced in it in its terms. But you know, more contemporary, actually, philosophers uh, contemporary with him, uh, like Maimon, right? And uh, more contemporary philosophers today, like Bergson, uh, see that view as also not necessarily true because time does not come to us from beyond. We manufacture time according to our habits. Time is a certain way by which we react to the, with the world through the formation of uh, conditioned responses. So we have different relationships of time. We do not have a standard time that is given transcendentally to us. And that is the imminent or genetic understanding of our right. temporality. And that would be more an imminent and feminist view uh, than the Kantian view. Here's the thing that I quite, think is quite interesting is that the, that is the normal interpretation of Kant, but there are some scholars that are coming out now and they're giving a view that's a lot more in line with, as you said, the genetic view or the more even a ph phenomenological view where it, it, there's some aspects of Kant that seem to uh, subvert the, the dominant way it's interpreted uh, uh, as you've said, in the yeah. sense that Kant seems to be engaging in a type of um, not empiricism per se, but that there are uh, relate. It's a subjectival relation, in a sense. Yeah. He's trying to do both, but I, I I I think you can read it both ways. But if you are interested in um, more subjectival resources on Kant, I can email you. Sure, I, I'd be happy to. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. I mean, none of these people are so simple. They are much more complex than what we make them to be. And there is a, 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 a you know, a, an imminent complexity to, to Kant, an undetermined aspect to Kant, that there's a lot uh, uh, of that in, in him as well. 